welcome to you can retain your desk list workers if you want to um we are scheduled to run for 45 minutes and as this is a live webinar we very much welcome your questions for neil um throughout so if anything pops up during the session please do pop them in the q a function which you should see at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can and if we run out of time we'll always take them offline and come back to you individually um, with any responses so my name's Hayley Preedy, I'm Marketing Manager here at WorkBuzz and um, today we're going to be talking specifically about the workforce challenges faced by our organi by organisations with large numbers of deskless employees. So um, let me hand straight over to our host Neil Haywood and he will introduce himself. Neil. Thanks Hayley, yeah my name's uh, Neil Haywood, I'm, I'm, I'm a former Chief People Officer I guess that's what I say now, I was at HS2, uh, the UK's largest infrastructure project in my last full-time role which I left about 18 months ago, uh, but I now make a living in a sort of portfolio career as I chair the People Board for the entirety of British horse racing in the UK, an industry which uh, employs about 20,000 people on race days, I'm the lead governor and trustee at a a university, Southampton Solent. I sit on the board of the National Skills Academy for Rail. I also act as a board advisor um, and I've invested in a number of entrepreneurial young business startups, not just in the UK, but around uh, the world. And um, I do some work for WorkBuzz here in the UK, hence I'm, I'm on the call uh, today with you all. Um, I consult privately on, on workforce issues. I, I did a lot of this in my full-time career uh, and I guess it's been the theme that's carried through to my kind of board and advisory work now. So I was really pleased to be invited by Hayley to, to, to join you to share some of these, this work and my thoughts with you all today. I, I think I probably hope uh, for two things, that those who've registered and are now listening, uh, most of you are still listening in 45 minutes because that's one measure of success. Uh, and I also hope that something that I say might prompt some reactions or comments from you as we go. Uh, so please, you know, there is an opportunity at the end to ask questions, but um, let's just make sure this perhaps isn't just me talking, but you know, me learning from your experiences as, as, as well. I'm certainly not offering any monopoly of, of knowledge, experience and wisdom in this space. There's a lot on this call, but I've got some observations that I hope you'll find um, thought provoking. So that, that's me, Hayley. Great, thanks, Neil. And um, just to what Neil said there, if you do have any comments to make rather than you want to ask any questions, obviously the chat function is there for you to, to add those comments in. So let's kick off um, and put things in context first of all, Neil. We've, we're referring here to deskless employees. Could you kind of tell us um, and define what we mean by when, when we say deskless employees? Uh, yes, uh, of course. Um, and um, it's a, it's a kind of good start point. And here, here are the definitions that I, I use. I mean, let's not confuse deskless uh, um, uh, with anything other than the fact we're talking about workers who are at the front line of so many sectors um, that we rely upon. Um, this isn't the same as workers who work in offices. The, the challenge for these people isn't around remote working or hybrid working. These are people who uh, all day, every day, are on duty at the front line of our businesses, face to face with customers. They, they make things, they manufacture things, they, they sell things, they are um, uh, out there doing, doing work for us. So they, so they don't sit behind a, a desk or a computer to do their job usually. Um, they have vastly different challenges than um, remote uh, workers do and, and um, you know, if you're working in one of the sectors on the right here, probably the bulk of your employee base will be what I would term uh, deskless workers. And the source of this is from the employee at March 2023. That's the top eight industries that are largely uh, non-desk. I'm interested in them because um, prompted by my last experience at HS2, a construction project, basically most of our workforce would have been out there on construction sites um, running uh, the job all day, every day. And that happened right the way throughout the pandemic across 320 locations. So these people weren't affected by the debate about you know, remote working or home working or furlough or whatever. They, they, they had jobs of work to do. Um, and then um, I think the other, prompt, the other prompt here is that um, if you look at the kind of um, Office for National Statistics uh, publication, the UK, and there's, a, there's an equivalent in every industry, and so in every country, by the way, 
Um, we currently have 1.124 million vacancies in the United Kingdom. You may have noticed this in, um, in your industries, which, is, which mainly concerns them. It's people working in these sectors. So there's kind of, a, there is a shortage of, of office workers. Don't get me wrong. If you've got scarce skills in some digital spaces, um, but this is a bigger problem. We have really severe skill shortages and a real lack of deskless workers in these eight sectors that make up a pretty large segment of those million plus vacancies. That's why it's hard to fill jobs and why it becomes even more important that if you have managed to fill jobs uh, with these deskless workers, you're, you're able to, to keep them. So I guess my mindset is, um, you know, do we spend a lot of time talking about the top of the pyramid and not enough time talking about the majority of the people who work for us and, and they are deskless employees? Okay, so why is it why is it important for people professionals to be thinking about deskless employees? It's all about the numbers. Um, yeah. <laughs> these are drawn from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I, I was I was I was flabbergasted when I looked at, at these numbers. Um, which wasn't done just for preparing uh, this, this conversation. I mean, 80% of the, of the world's population at work doesn't sit behind a desk. And there's 2.7 billion uh, uh, people, in effect, who are working like this all day, every day. And if you turn that into just a, a drill down into what that means in America, as one of the largest, still the world's largest economy, well, look at those numbers, 13.3 million retail workers, 8.8 .8 million manufacturing, um, 20 million, nearly 21 million in healthcare and, 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 uh, and education. I just, I just wonder if we, uh, at uh, the top of organisations, predominantly in office jobs, predominantly C-suite in our thinking, I just wonder if we put perhaps a bit of a disproportionate emphasis on the problems of 20%, uh, in the leadership and management or office space roles at the expense of the bulk of the world's working population or population that really is at the heart of our, our businesses. And I have to say my own light bulb moment on this only came relatively recently. So uh, I guess I'm proving that you're never too old to learn something new because I was already pretty old when I learned this, but <laughs> I, it came at, came at HS2. Um, when I joined HS2 as the Chief People Officer in 2017, a job that I held for four years through to 2021, um, it, was, it, it, was, um, it was something that we did. We, we completed a workforce forecast for the project that accurately predicted that at peak construction, HS2 would be employing about 30,000 uh, workers, uh, mainly deskless. And the problem was that our analysis of the UK workforce said not only that we needed 30,000, but that there wasn't 30,000 spare capacity in the industry. So to get our 30,000, we we're either gonna to have to hire 30,000 of everybody else's workers, uh, which obviously has the, the consequence of, you're gonna to have to pay them more money to tempt them uh, across to you, because if there's a shortage, one of the consequences of shortages is that, is that wages and, and wage inflation rises, or the workforce population is gonna to have to expand. In other words, we're gonna to have to make more people available to construction in the UK because the workforce wasn't um, big enough. Now, our success in doing that uh, is actually one reason why there are th 3,000 workless job starts on the HS2 programme. Those are people with, who had no trade, no craft in construction, who were taken from uh, registration at a job centre, uh, taken on by some, someone somewhere in our supply chain, and in effect trained and equipped to do a construction job, um, many of whom were also apprenticeships. So 3,000 people the workforce has expanded by. Um, so it just made it really obvious that um, you need to work hard to find deskless workers. Uh, if you have to invest in the way that we were investing in order to expand the population, the one thing you really don't want to do having got them is then lose them. So. Um, if there's a supply problem, you can do a certain amount to expand supply, but it, for it, but it takes ages. And if there's a demand problem, you have to work really, really hard um, to keep the people that you've got, because otherwise uh, other people will be interested in hiring um, your workers from you. And I guess that's what I see going on in the UK workforce at the moment across any number of sectors. It's the problem in rail. 
Um, it certainly uh, 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 remains a problem in some construction companies. It's undoubtedly a problem in education and, and care, as I think some people on this on this call will, will know. So um, why is it important? That was the question. Well, uh, it's important because um, you've all got, we've all got issues in society around keeping uh, staff that we've managed to attract. And uh, the problem isn't um, gonna get any easier. And you know, the numbers in the UK would be much smaller, but they would be similar in terms of order of magnitude around the size and scale of the problem in a much smaller economy. And you can find these figures for the UK, for Europe, for Asia, and the same pattern uh, is clear everywhere. That's okay, what is, is this is this more important now than it used to be? Why does it matter right now? Uh, I think it is more important than it used to be, um, and I'm going to be perhaps a bit a bit challenging on 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 this. Um, and this is this is this is really going back to um, what you've got in front of you here. Um, the first thing is, um, in, in the old days, and one might argue the old days weren't so far ago, it might even be pre-pandemic, um, but um, in the old days, as an employer, I used to think my main problem was attracting people. Um, but I didn't worry about there being insufficient supply of people to attract. I just had to get go out into the marketplace and get my fair share. And to an extent, therefore, the availability of skilled people was a commodity. But we're not in that situation anymore. The reality is um, there's a shortage of folk. So 98, 92% of UK employees have struggled to fill job roles in the last year is what they've told HRD online in a survey. Um, and um, I would argue that that is set to continue. Um, incidentally, just a couple of other data points for those who like data. Um, in 1997-98, when the Blair government, Labour government, came in the UK, about 25% of 16 to 18 year olds stayed on in further education. The figure is now 48%. So if you're hiring at the, the, the youngest possible end of the workforce, the reality is there are fewer people entering the job market as early as they used to, even before you get into the fact that one or two generations later, they have different expectations about the world. But, about the world of work. And then if I look forward, again, it's, it's office of, uh, of it's, it's the government statistics on this, um, population of 11 to 16 year olds um, in school by 2035 drops by 1.1 million or 11%. So um, for those of you who will still be working in 2035, and I won't be, because I'll be uh, 70 years old by then. Um, for those of you still working in 2035, this, this trying to hire people to get them to come in to your company is going to be as acute a problem then as it is now, if not many more times so. So in other words, demographically, you can see that this is an issue that's here to stay for companies and for us as, as HR professionals. Um, and that's why the number of vacancies in the UK economy, the figure I mentioned, 1.124 million, is still about 300,000 higher than it was pre-pandemic. Um, we, we lost quite a lot of workers during the pandemic. A number of people retired. A number of people have gone back to countries of origin. Um, and uh, if anybody's trying to deal at the moment with the UK shortage occupation list, this is the government's registration of trades, crafts, jobs, roles that it is prepared to concede some immigration is a good idea on. If you're having to deal with uh, anybody uh, who defines that list and you're seeking to get exemptions so that you can add your workforce to the list where you can bring in people from overseas, well, good luck with that because we've obviously got a certain political tone from this government. Um, there isn't that significantly different a tone from a Labour government in waiting. And frankly, it's just very hard work to get um, these categories um, uh, opened up. I, I know this, by the way, because obviously this is a line of inquiry for the British horse racing um, industry, because um, we need a lot of 16 to 18 year olds who like working with horses who are going to work in training yards in all weathers, um, probably on a six day a week basis. And it's not necessarily attractive work for UK 16 to 18 year olds. So I think I basically just think we would all do well to frame the problem of desperate workers as a retention one because supply is difficult to expand in the short term 
and a retention one that's going to last quite a long time. I think we might look upon this as business as usual, whereas when I was growing up as an HR professional, business as usual was there were more people than there were vacancies, and now we're the other way around, and that's, that's, um, that's just life. So it's an important issue because, frankly, if you don't deal with it, your company is going to be struggling to get the work as it needs. Okay, so that's the scenario at the moment. That's what's happening out there in the marketplace. And um, but in your experience, what are employers missing um, when they're thinking about deskless employees? Well, I think uh, one of the issues is that employers tend to make assumptions around what it's going to take to attract and keep deskless employees, um, which may not be rooted in the actual issues or concerns that their deskless employees. Have. So I, I start from a premise that says, do you have a complete or incomplete understanding of what these workers want in the context of your, your company? And um, I have worked with a number of organizations um, where I would say there has been a disconnect. There was a disconnect initially at HS2. There was certainly a disconnect at post office, uh, all for different reasons. Um, and even back into central government, when I worked in the Ministry of Justice, there was a disconnect um, around frontline workers in prison, probation, and so on. And um, McKinsey did a really interesting study on this last year, which I've just summarized here, but you can freely read this report. And it basically said, um, we've done some analysis, and this disconnect that we perceived existed uh, does exist. So um, what McKinsey suggested was that um, employees are interested more than employers think they are in job growth, pay, um, developing aligned skill sets and learning opportunities. Whereas employers tend to think that employees are more interested in having an opportunity to have a say, in other words, being involved in decision making, um, recognition and reward, um, status symbols like titles, and possibly more responsibility. Now, some of these things overlap and the the devil is in the detail. I just use this to illustrate that there's a disconnect. Um, my challenge to everyone on the call is, do you know if you have a disconnect or not? And if you do, are you acting on it or not? And if you don't know the answer to that, and, and if you do and you're not doing anything about it, it, you're going to make it quite hard or harder to keep the deskless workers that you fought really hard in a very competitive, very crowded, labor market uh, to, to, to land. So here is the challenge for employers. Do you know what your frontline deskless workers really think and feel about working for you? Because if you don't, you could be at risk of losing them. And my argument is um, you can keep them if you want to, but you have to start by understanding what they want. Okay, so how does WorkBuzz help do that? Well, I think, um, and obviously this is a perspective based on having been a client of, of WorkBuzz, and you have many other uh, similar clients and large organisations who would say the same, but I think WorkBuzz exists to close the misinformation and misconception gaps that that McKinsey report highlighted. Because your mission is all about changing lives of a million plus people at work, you can only do that one employer at a time by making sure that those clients who use your technology platform, use your survey tools, get insights and do something about those insights to make a difference to their workforces. Therefore, bit by bit, employer by employer, you are aggregating the difference to a million plus working lives, which is your, which is your ambition and, and, and mission. And I, and I summarize it um, in a way that I, I'm not sure, I'm not in sure, I'm not quite sure you, you do, but I think if you work with WorkBuzz, and this was my experience at HS2, then in effect, the information and insights I get or I got from you was um, I, I, knew, um, I knew whether my employees fitted into the big picture or not, whether they thought that they were valued and appreciated by by, uh, by management. Um, I um, could tell whether they knew what they do, they were doing for the employer at HS2 and others mattered or not. Um, I, 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 I knew uh, whether those employees um, 
understood what we expected of them and what good looked like. I knew if recognition and appreciation was embedded as part of the culture or not. Um, I knew um, uh, I knew whether they felt supported, which is where consistent coaching comes into it. And obviously the fundamental underpin is, 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 is listened to. Um, just as a matter of interest, because there's always data points. And I'm not saying this is a, I'm not saying this is true of people listening uh, today or, or not, but I love, I love points of uh, points of data. I, I um, I'm working with um, quite a large uh, company as a consultant, and we've identified that at the moment that business spends about fifty pounds a head per employee on learning and development for them, um, and they employ about seven or eight thousand people. And it's not that 50 pounds a head is the right number or the wrong number. It's not very much, but they have absolutely no idea whether that 50 pounds a head is right or not, because they're not talking to the people that they have about it. So we ran a survey um, and, um, and we found, lo and behold, 40% of their frontline deskless people reported not even receiving 50 pounds a head a year and feeling that they were substantially under-recognized and under-invested in and, and, and. And the parts of the business where those feelings were highest, guess what, turned out to be the parts of the business where employee churn or regretted churn was also the, the highest. And um, I'm still working through with that company and it was a work bus survey, um, what they should do about it but it's kind of almost like the uncomfortable truths um mm -hmm. so going back to the positives if you work with work bus my message to anyone on this call is you will get insights that could be uncomfortable but you do have experience advice and guidance from uh, the work bus team not only in framing how you ask and what you ask but also on how you do something about what your employees tell you mm -hmm. and the people science team in this space is a is a real value add and a real a real differentiator. Um, so I think, you know, I think these are all potential advantages of the work buzz approach, but it's the integration that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on to um, probably what's going to be high on the agenda of our listeners today around what tips or advice you could give employers on how to keep their distless employees. Yeah, I mean, uh, you will, you will have uh, your own answer if you've got insights from your uh, from your deskless employees and your answer won't necessarily be in all of these spaces but there will be priorities in some of these spaces without uh, any uh, any any without any doubt um, so let's pick up on one purpose um, your deskless workers face challenges really quite removed from those of traditional office employees um, that the dispersed nature of their work means they can face a lack of internal communications, making it much harder for them to stay connected with their managers and to keep up to date with the, the latest information you want them to have. Um, so you can counteract that risk by making it clear that there's a really compelling mission and vision for your business. And your start point has to be making all of your employees, starting with your, your frontline deskless workers, feel connected to that because if they're feeling passionate about what you're in business to do, and they feel it's something that's useful and worthwhile, that's intrinsically more motivating uh, and enables people to start to want to perform at their very best. So an example there, um, whatever you think of them or don't think of them, I know for a fact that Apple send daily motivational video messages from their C-suite to everyone in their manufacturing and retail operations. Uh, and seeing or hearing managers or at DEXs being passionate and positive and enthusiastic about the purpose of business helps everyone connect with it. Um, another one that, um, that, um, that comes out, uh, I think, quite consistently is the kind of reward and recognition space. So I'll just use this as one last illustration. I could, I could illustrate all of them. Um, we've got, I think, uh, Hayley, some, um, so a blog or some notes that we're going to put up after this, which uh, people can follow up on but one other would be well recognition and reward uh, this is rather than intrinsic which is around the purpose of a company uh extrinsic most motivation is, rec is is recognition and reward you know 
external factors like praise or reward can help somebody feel more connected to the job that they're doing. And it's a, it's a cornerstone of anything that's ever been written about employee, um, employee motivation. Um, and I don't think this has to get too complicated. Um, um, and the more motive, uh, I think, you know, physical or virtual, thank you or well done cards, company-wide or team-specific acknowledgements or emails, flashcards or video messages. Uh, there is lots of recognition reward software out there now, which didn't used to exist. I like bonusly, it's praise on social media, employee of the week, fame or, or, or hall of fame initiatives, badges or in-app visuals, simply simple verbal uh, verbal thank yous. All of these things um, uh, can uh, can have an impact. And somebody's called out uh, well-being. I noticed in the, in the chat, so I, I'll say something about that. Um, I think this is about ensuring that your frontline deskless workers have access to all of the available online uh, and tools and support in occupational and mental health and well-being that you have given to your office staff. But to get that to happen, your start point is often having to provide them with better technology. So um, I, I have seen workforces that have realized that mobile tools are far better suited to the nature of frontline work um, uh, they enable people to complete tasks quickly, but they actually enable people to access services and support quickly. Um, and it creates a kind of one team, one, one company culture that can be quite, quite embracing. So um, if you're thinking about well-being, think about the app-based services that are now widely available. And ensure that all of your employees can access them with uh, equal ease through their mobile phone technologies. Um, Boots opticians, I'm well aware, um, have ensured that all of their employees have an app in this space um, to ensure communication, collaboration, well-being, and mental health support, covering nearly 6,000 um, um, uh, team members throughout the UK, which has also had the added benefit of creating a kind of relentless sense of we're all in it together and customers come first and 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 and. Um, I don't pretend, uh, and, I, and I don't want anyone to take the wrong view on this, I don't pretend any of this is easy. And I don't pretend you have to do all of these things to keep your deskless workers. I, I do, though, believe that with your own insights from your own survey tools, these are the themes that are likely to come out, because uh, that's what WorkBuzz have experienced through running many, many, many surveys over many years now. And then you'll have to drill into the data and work out where your real choices and priorities are and when i talk about deathless workers even the way you deliver the tool and the survey um, uh, makes a difference you will get a higher response rate if you're going phone app based than if you're doing desktop or kiosk based or heaven forbid if you're still doing paper and pencil based which we were all doing not so very long ago but you will get a set of answers that are quite um quite powerful and um you know one or other of these boxes could be the key to triggering higher levels of attention for your staff. Thanks. Um, one of the um, virtual wellbeing tool that's just been called out in the chat just for everybody's information is Microsoft Viva. I don't know if you've had any experience with that, Neil, but uh, someone's recommended that there. I'd love um, to hear about it. I'm not familiar with it, um, but I'm, I'm here to learn as well. So now I've got that note, I should go away uh, and investigate it for sure. OK, um, it might be worth mentioning, actually, one of our customers that has um, got a huge population of deskless workforces of workforce, sorry, um, that has vastly improved their employee engagement just in the first year of working with WorkBuzz. Um, and that is LKQ. So um, just to give you a little bit of information about what they've been up to, if you're not aware of the organisation, they are a leading distributor of car, LCV and speciality parts, and they've got over 9,000 employees across, I think, 280 branches across the UK, and they're part of a wider global organisation. Um, in 2019, they had the challenge of turning the business round post a new management team being put in place, and part of that challenge was to embed a new culture and improve employee engagement. And in 2021, so just over well, nearly two years ago now, they partnered with us to run their first employee engagement survey following this restructure. 
Um, and they've taken those results and turned th those insights into action, and they've achieved some really significant uplift in engagement metrics across the board, as you can see here. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details about that, but it's a really good case study and there's a video to watch as well. So what we'll do is we'll um, share that information with you post webinar, because I think it's a really good insight into how this works in actual practice with a big desolate workforce. Um, I, actually, so I actually heard um, I heard Donna speak at Work Buzz Live last year, and it's a really very inspiring, very compelling story. And I've also met um, um, some of her other colleagues on a global basis who are now sort of taking this work beyond the UK into the rest of a much larger group on the back of this as a, a successful case study. I, I think if, if, um, if I could speak for her only in this sense, um, what she did have to get to this outcome was a situation that was inadequate and a crisis situation to walk into where there were significant workforce issues. And she was hired by a management team on the basis of uh, needing to, they, them needing advice and guidance on achieving a, a turnaround. It's much to her credit that she's delivered that. It's much to their credit and the CEO's credit that they recognise they needed that. And I do appreciate that's not everyone's start point. Sometimes it's the other way around. You argue and get the data and then the data prompts the need to change things. And you just have to win the argument about let's see what what let's see what we could do to make things different because we have a problem here. OK, thank you, Neil. So it's time to uh, ask your own questions. If anybody has any questions they would like to ask Neil, um, like we say, you can pop them in the Q&A here or alternatively in the chat. Um, just while we're waiting to see if anybody does have any burning questions they would like to answer um, to ask, we have had one or two come in from people um, prior to the webinar. Um, so one which is slightly a little bit away from just a deskless situation, but a general um, sort of remote working, hybrid working question is um, around the culture of hybrid working and what to do to encourage people back into the office. So this particular person offers remote or hybrid working, but not many people have chosen to come back to the office. And they feel that that's having an effect on things like new starters, interactions or relationships with their colleagues. Um, so their question is, how can you make their colleagues or their team members realise that they have a responsibility to their peers and their company to finding that balance with hybrid working? It's a really good question. I mean, this is not a deskless question. This is a question that affects office space staff and, and um, the remote hybrid versus office debate, which is still, I'm, I'm absolutely certain, live. A couple of interesting observations. I mean, the first thing is there is definitely a drift uh, back to a more office based presence happening. Uh, at the moment, uh, and, and where, where's my, my source of data for that? There's always a source of data. Well, because I'm involved in the rail industry, I'm looking at the volume of passenger journeys being undertaken and on what days. And we're back to something like 80% of passenger journeys on Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays, but not Monday and Friday. I'm sure that won't surprise uh, any of you. So there's, there's a drift back to office working going on. Now, my question about that is, is that a drift that the employees themselves are leading because they've suddenly decided or have generally come to feel that there is a benefit from working in the office? Or is it a company directed drift because somebody has structured rules and regulations and requirements on people? And I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest out there amongst employers it's both. But I've got a bet here that I'll lay with you around which will be the long term most successful and the long term most successful will be the one where the employees themselves are generating the reasons to want to be in the office on certain days. Now, um, what do you do with the population that isn't coming into the office? And let's be honest, um, I'm going to call this out, uh, 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 perhaps at risk of, of, of it not being true of your organisation, but it's a bit different when you're a comfortable senior level executive in a nice house in the country with plentiful uh, um, uh, uh, work, no, great working conditions. And the idea that you might commute in uh, just because other people, I think it's a leadership problem. Whereas if you're a younger person, flat sharing, working in a city, the conditions aren't as comfortable, 
and actually you get energy from being with your peer group, other people in your in your generation or experience at work, um, and you want to to, um, to to share with one another and learn. You're probably got, going to want to go back to the office. So I'm afraid there's nothing that can be done here, in my view, except a candid conversation from a CEO with their exec team or C-suite colleagues about an expectation that they have of senior leaders, that senior leaders set an example and should be in the office on a, a certain uh, agreed rotor or roster of days. In other words, if the company said we expect our employees to be in the office two days out of five, there is no circumstance in which you can allow anybody at a senior management team or above not to fulfill that. They have to be 100%. So um, at HS2, we guided that, and then I monitored it, and then we directed it in a few cases after it became clear that the right example wasn't being set. Um, of course, you have to do one other thing, which is if you are going to be in the office, you have to generate uh, meetings and discussions that involve a purpose of being in the office, because it is absolutely soul-destroying coming into the office, ticking off one of your mandatory days, only to find that all the other people that you were in the office to see are still on the other end of the screen and you're looking at them because that really does make it feel like the commute and the journey time and the cost and the early morning was a complete uh, waste of time. So you have to start with some benefit needs. Incidentally, um, perhaps one last bias of mine, um, if you're working uh, for Sir Martin Sorrell or you're working for Sir James Dyson, good luck with that because just being the senior incredibly well-paid person issuing diktats from the corporate center about how life should be to your ordinary workers i've never seen an example where that was a good idea thanks neil and some comments coming in from the chat are, are, are echoing that it's all about open communication and expectation of all and there's a mutual respect there both of leadership and you know people who are more on the operational front um and at Workbirds, we do find that cake is a great motivator on, a, on our main day of attending. There is generally cake or a bag of sweets for everybody who turns up. So that's always a good one to why put don't, there. Well, why don't you, why don't you <laughs> just explain to everyone, Hayley, how Workbirds organise it? What, what has, what has, you've got about 50 or 60 people now. Um, yeah. what, what, what are the rules uh, or guidance that you've given Workbirds employees? Because it's a very so, strong corporate culture very high mm -hmm. levels of engagement. How have you kept that whilst, you know, whilst solving this dilemma that, that our colleagues have got? So we have a secure, a, a, a main day that everybody comes into the office, which is Wednesday. And that Wednesday, like you said, is a day where we um, purposefully put in all company meetings on a monthly basis. We purposefully have a celebratory 10 minutes every Wednesday morning where people can share their successes over the last week. Um, we always, like I said, have cake on a Thursday, well, pretty much always have a cake on a Wednesday afternoon, which again is a celebration of, of milestones of people's careers or life. So we have um, birthdays celebrated and uh, working anniversaries, etc. Anything exciting that's going on that. It's very much about creating a community for those people who come into the office on a Wednesday. Around that, we have a second day allocated and that's decided upon by each team. So each team come in to make the most of being together on a specific day. And that's usually complementary of teams that work together being in on the same day as well. Yeah, so that's a workable solution that you've managed to organise amongst 50 or 60 people that everyone's bought into. There's no problem. Compliance isn't an issue because actually yeah. everyone knows what the expectation is and they love coming in to do that because the rest of the time outside of that requirement, they're treated as responsible uh, adults who... Um, uh, can be trusted to get more than a good job done and because they're in constant <clears throat> contact with their colleagues through the, your various online mechanisms so exactly. um, it also, it's very, it's it also works them um, it also <laughs> works for um attracting people who may not be local to the office because yeah. that you know we've got people working with work who are as far far north as you know right up northern england we're in milton Keynes ourselves we've got people coming from the south coast so actually having that that day in the middle of the day that everybody knows everyone's going to be in makes it an expectation that's achievable for everybody and it means that we can attract and, and retain people from further afield than just the local um employee pool okay if anybody's got any more questions please do uh 
drop them into the Q&A now. We've got a few more minutes left. Um, but if not, let me just uh, move on to what to expect post webinar uh, in terms of resources. So thank you very much for listening. Um, keep an eye out for an email from my colleagues, Emily or Fiona. They'll be following up with you um, shortly. And what we'll send over to you is the recording that we're doing now. We'll send you the case study and very helpfully a tips and tricks blog that Neil has put together for us that follows up from this webinar with some key actions that you can take away and think about. Um, we would strongly recommend that you come and join us on our next webinar, which is happening on the 27th of June. And whilst it says it's building a stronger workforce in manufacturing and production, I actually met the um, panel last week and Quite frankly, if you've got desktop smokers, remote workers or multilingual workers in your workforce, you want to be coming in and listening to the, uh, this particular webinar. It's got Hovis, ISS and um, Camellia, who are all food production manufacturers on there. So some great insights from them who are actually working on the cold base right now. Um, they will send you the link through on the follow up email if you want to register for that. And as always, if you want to have a demo of the Workbuzz platform or have any further questions, you can either respond to Emily or Fiona or you can drop us a line at hello at workbuzz.com. Um, so nothing else to say if there's no more questions apart from thank you very much for joining us, Neil, and for sharing your insights. Pleasure. If anybody wants to get in touch on LinkedIn or ask any questions subsequently, just feel free to to get in contact. As I said, I do do some work with WorkBuzz. I'm happy to help any of you who are WorkBuzz uh, clients. If, if I can, I may not be able to, but um, it's been a pleasure sharing. And thank you to the 35 people who stayed to the end, which is nearly <laughs> what we started with. I, that's always a mark of success when I'm doing a call. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the bye -bye. week. Bye-bye. Bye.